time with the elders. And the elders told me stories. And what I'm going to share with you is about my, my own life. I don't have no, no uh, papers or, or anything. But as, as you heard, I was a chief for four years and also a bank counselor for many years and also MC powerhouse. When you're, when you're a bank counselor, you go into meetings, you, you sit and drive, you ride a plane, you're sitting all the way over there. When you're in meeting, you're sitting all the way through the meeting. Even as chief, that's, uh, we're doing a lot of sitting, not a lot of activity. And the only time we ever get up when we're in, when you're in politics is when it's lunch break. <laughs> you get, you go to the buffet or, or smorgasbord, you pick all the food you want and eat. And then sometimes you hit one meeting, then you have to travel again. You sit and drive, you're driving. And then you stop at McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken because you have to eat on the go. And many years I've done that, almost two decades. And after two decades of, of living like that, I was not healthy. I was 220 pounds. And uh, one day at the office, at the band office, there's a group of people, nurses, doctors, or whatever they call them, slick. They check your liver, your kidneys, your blood pressure, your blood sugar levels, and everything. And they said, oh, hey, chief, you should come get a checkup. And I said, no. I, I think I'm good. I'm healthy. I thought I was. But uh, I said, maybe uh, wait, wait for people. People are coming in, so no, I'm good. I, I don't think I need a, I need a checkup. So anyway, but the one nurse was very persistent. Mr. Alexis, you better come with me. And my dad told me not to argue with women, so I said, <laughs> yeah, okay. So he, he put something on my, my, my thing and pressed a button and it went real tight and the numbers started to show up. My blood pressure was 168, the top one, and the bottom one was 98. And he said, you have high blood pressure. Then he made me get on a, get on a scale, weight scale. I got on a weight scale. And they have what they call a body mass index. If you're this, this tall and this age, he should be about this weight, but I was overweight, he said. I was 220 pounds. And then they checked, poked me in with a needle here on my finger, some blood came out. So they put something in there and, and that thing went up. I think it went up to 12. So I had high blood, blood sugar. Then they made me pee in a little cute tube and and to check my protein and stuff like that. And that one was okay, but, but I, I thought I was healthy, but I wasn't. I was overweight, high blood pressure, high blood sugar. And then they made an arrangement with me to go see a doctor. The doctor came and he said, Mr. Lexus, I'm gonna, might have to recommend, prescribe uh, metformin or Avandia, whichever one, might work, but we're going to try it. And I said, why? That to manage your blood sugar levels, not to cure it, just manage it. That's what they said. And what if my blood sugar levels go down? Can I stop taking that stuff? And he said, no, once you take it, you take it for the rest of your life. And for your high blood pressure, I can, uh, prescribe blood pressure pills for you. So I said, once my blood pressure goes down, can I stop taking it? He said, no. Once you take it, you take it for the rest of your life. So I said, let me think about it. <laughs> let me think about it, because I don't want to be taking too many things for the rest of my life. 
I seen what the doctor did to our, our people. The doctor, they, you know, even though there's nothing wrong with you, they'll say they'll find something wrong with you and prescribe you medication. That's how our people got addicted to drugs. Tylenol with codeine, Percocets, all these things, painkillers, they prescribe them. They're mixed with codeine, methadone, heroin. And once our people start taking it, they start getting addicted to it. And there's a drug epidemic in our communities. A lot of our young people, they're hooked on drugs, they're drinking. And so I, I told them, I'm, I'm, I don't want to take no prescription drugs. I'm going to visit my uncle, the elders. I'm going to visit them and see what they got. Because I, he says, you think they can help you? I says, yeah. They know all about roots and herbs and everything. They got ceremonies. They, they can grow medicine. They can make medicine and stuff like that. So he said, OK. But if, if nothing else works out, I might be back. So I went back. I was went back and I thought about it. and. I thought I was healthy, and I still thought I was healthy. I was in denial. I said, I can't be, my blood sugar level can't be high. My blood pressure, I don't feel nothing. I don't feel symptoms. I was just overweight. So, but I thought maybe I'll get a second opinion. So I went to a, my doctor, the one I usually go see once in a while. And he checked me and he said, do a 12 hour fast and come back. So I did a 12 hour fast next day I went there. He checked my blood pressure, it was high. My blood sugar levels were as high. I sent some blood tests and samples to the lab and I waited for a few hours, came back. And everything, what, what the slick team said was, I was overweight, high blood pressure, high, high sugar levels. And so I thought, the doctor said, do you, need, uh, do you need me to prescribe anything? And I said, no, I'm gonna go see some elders and my uncle. So I went, I went to uh, visit my uncle. I knocked on his door, come in. I went in, oh, it's you nephew. What do you want? And I said, well, I come to visit you. Well, you hardly visit me, nephew. You must want something. The only time you come visit me is when you want something. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I want something. I hear our people uh, have uh, medicines, roots, herbs, and stuff to help cure people. And he, he said, Yes, and, and I said, I also know you do ceremonies and sweats, and that's how you help people. And he said, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It depends on the person. And I said, and I told him what the doctor told me. I told him, he told him, the doctor told me I was overweight. The doctor said I had a high blood pressure. The doctor said I had high blood sugar. And I don't know what else is wrong with me. I didn't get x-rays, or I didn't get a real good checkup. But, but uh, I need help. I need medicine. I want you to make medicine for me. He looked at me and said, maybe I will, maybe I won't. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, we can, I can help you, help yourself. I cannot heal you because you have your own mind, your own heart, your own body, your own spirit. I can only help you and guide you to heal yourself. And I said, I thought you, you guys had medicine, you guys did magic and stuff like that. He <laughs> said, no, that's uh, only, only stories. But he said, 
If you want help, I can help you, but you got to give uh, at least four months of your life. Come and stay with me and I can help you. And I told him, but there's an election coming up next month. I'm, my term for chief is going to be over and, and the people want me to run again. And he looked at me and said, why do you want to look after your people when you can't even look after yourself? <laughs> and that made me think. He says, you have to look after yourself first. Because he said, what you're doing is hectic, stressful, demanding, thankless job. No matter what you do in politics, all the good you do, nobody recognizes it. You do one bad thing, that's what when everybody attacks you. And he said, stay out of politics and come come live with me. I thought about it. They put my name up, election came, nomination came, I got nominated, and they put my name up. Two weeks before election, I took my name down. I went to live with my uncle. And that first morning, he woke me up Wake up, nephew, wake up. I woke up. Here, drink a, a glass of water. So I drank a glass of water. And he said, after you drink that water, we're going to go climb that, that hill over there. It's about a mile long, a mile high, that hill. And I said, aren't we going to have coffee or breakfast or anything? He says, no, you'd have to drink water, and then we, we go. He didn't explain to me anything that was, he was planning or doing. He just told me to drink the water, and I drank the water, and after I drank the put your shoes on and let's go. So I went, I put my shoes on, and I went with him. I said, we're going to go on top that hill, and we're going to smudge over on top the hill and say a prayer. So I, I walked with him. My uncle was 93 years old. He was walking. Walk about 200 yards already. <sighs> I was <sighs> sweating and running out of breath, and right through here I was hurting from. I was physically out of shape, and I told Uncle, Uncle, I'm played out now. I'm running, uh, sweating and running out of air. I need to rest. So as soon as I, I sat down, he said, okay, we'll let you rest a few minutes. We'll let you rest a few minutes. So while I was resting, I took my cigarette out I, and I put one in there and I lit it. My uncle came there and took the cigarette out of me. You want good health, you got to earn it. Broke that cigarette, threw it on the ground. So he says, when you want good health, it's what you do for yourself. That's going to make a difference. And smoking is not going to help you. Smoking affects your heart, your lungs. I still smoke today, but what he did then, it kind of uh, scared me. i never seen my uncle that mad. <laughs> so after I rested, going climbing on top of that hill, I stopped and rested about seven times. I was sweating, running out of breath, and my feet were hurting. So he made me walk on top of that hill, said a prayer, smudge, and then we came down. Coming down wasn't too bad. But after a couple of weeks of doing that, every morning we did that, drink water, climb that hill. And I, on the way up, after two weeks, I only stopped about three times to rest. And this went on, and then a month went by, we're still doing that thing. After a month, I only stopped once, climbing that hill. And on the, on the way climbing up that hill, uh, I asked my uncle, when are we going to make medicine? When are we going to do ceremony? When are we going to sweat? Oh, you want to sweat? I said, yeah. Okay, we will sweat when the time comes, but for now, this is what we do. So we climbed that hill <clears throat> and came back. Next morning, my uncle gave me a pack sack. 
And he said, next, next morning when, when, when we go for a walk, after we drink that water, we go for a walk, bring the pack sack. We're going to climb that hill again. So I put the pack sack, packed the pack sack, and I, and I went. And while we're going up the hill, my uncle found some rocks and put some tobacco and said the prayer. And, Nephew, wait, I got to put the rock in. <laughs> but we're going up the hill. He said, yeah, but I found the rock now, and the rock is ready. <laughs> said, can we leave it here? And when I come back down, I can pick it up. He said, no, we found it now. We take it now. <laughs> so on the way up, finding rocks, he put it in a pack sack, and he made me pack it, extra few pounds. And that went on for another couple of weeks. About a month and a half went by. And my pants started getting loose. I had to tie a string from one <laughs> thing to the other. And I told my uncle, I think my pants are getting loose. I might need to go buy new clothes. And he said, yeah, that happens. And, uh, and I asked him, why don't we eat in the morning? have coffee or breakfast and go, why are you drinking only water? When you drink water, water doesn't have sugar or calories or anything. And when you're walking without eating, you're burning the, the fat and the calories in your body. Because if you eat before you go, you'll only be eating the food that you ate just now. So that's why he was making me walk without eating. And I walked for a long time. And uh, I said, do you know when, when we're going to start doing medicine and ceremony and sweat? And he said, yeah. Time will come. Don't crush me. So after two months, he said, uh, nephew, I got I got invited to a gathering. I'm going to be gone for four days. Take four days off and uh, and then come back in four days. We'll continue. So he went away and I went, I came home. While I was home, I went to visit the doctor again. And he said, well, do it, do it another 12 hour fast. And then we'll do some tests. Check my blood pressure. My blood pressure went down a little bit, slightly, not too much. But my blood sugar levels were were under seven, I think six point two. And I weighed myself, I was 188 pounds. And my pants were too big, so I had to go to Value Village and <laughs> and buy new pants and everything. So after four days, I went back and, and I told my uncle, I think whatever it is we're doing is uh, not helping too much. My blood pressure is still high, slightly down, but my sugar levels are, are good. And I lost, I lost uh, 32 pounds. He said, that's good. So, but tomorrow we continue again, and, we, and you're going to bring the bring the pack sack again. We're going to pick rocks on the way up there and all the way back down. So I went, we did like, we did like that. And after, on the third month, he started, he said, you know, why you've been uh, moody and cranky? And I said, why? Because I've been feeding you traditional foods. Uncle, he lived off the land. He was hunting moose, elk, deer, rabbits, bush chickens, and his potatoes and uh, eggs he bought from the hot rights and chickens too. And uh, so I, I was eating like that, and that's why from uh, eating from uh, processed foods, I was having withdrawal symptoms, and my uncle noticed, he said, you haven't withdrawal symptoms from all the food that you were addicted to. But the food that we eat today is processed foods. It's got chemicals, additives, and sugar, and 
what, whatever, it is, whatever it is, no matter how much you eat, you're still going to be hungry. So, but I, I spent time with my uncle, and he told me about the plants and and the wild roots and vegetables and mushrooms and peanuts and berries and everything that our people used to eat for thousands of years. And our people were healthy and they were active. And uh, my uncle said, how do you feel today? And I felt good. Now after three months, I can walk on top of that hill without sweating, without running out of air and stuff like that. And I started to feel good. And he kept me up like that on the fourth month. We had two sweats. And he taught me a few songs and how to do things. I had to cut his wood for, for his sweat, go find the rocks, go get the water, cut the willows and everything. And we did a serve, <clears throat> what they call a healing ceremony. He said, a person that comes to see him, he says, he cannot heal them, but he can guide us. So he said, I'm glad you decided to stay with me for four months because there's not much I can do for you, but if what you can do for yourself, that's going to make a difference. What you do for your mind to heal your mind, what you do for your heart to heal your heart, your body, your spirit. You need to heal yourself. So most of us, we have our own minds, our own hearts, our own body, our own spirit. And it's what we do for ourselves that's going to make a difference in our lives. So after four months, I went home. We're done. My uncle said, we're done. After four months, I had to go back to Value Village and buy some more. <laughs> And when we're done, I went to the doctor again. He weighed me. I was 155 pounds. He checked my blood pressure. My blood pressure came down very lots. It was at 132 over 80. And yesterday I checked my blood pressure. It was 121 over 78 and my pulse was 74. So my pressure is good, my blood pressure is good. And I checked, had the doctor check my, poke me with a needle and when the blood came out, he checked the, my, my blood sugar levels. My blood sugar level was at 4.2. So I don't know too much about health, from the white man's system perspective, the pharmaceutical industry, the medical industry, the health industry is a money-making business. They won't tell you what, what to do. And they'll, our diet has changed for, in the last 50, 60 years. Our people used to eat moose meat, rabbits, fish, ducks, muskrats, wild roots, wild vegetables, we pick berries. Uh, we had healthy diets for a long, long time. And now we, our people eat only processed foods. When I lived with my uncle, when I drank coffee, he wouldn't let me drink sugar or milk. He said, here's some honey. I have a friend that raises honeybees. Use it for sugar. And I still use honey today for or sugar. After about 24 years, I'm still drinking honey with my coffee. And I don't drink milk because a lot of people say milk is healthy for you. But the people who tell me milk is healthy for me are not healthy themselves. Milk was meant for the cow, a little bitty cow. The only time we were we're supposed to drink milk is when we breastfeed off our mothers. And the milk that they, they make today, they put additives in it, preservatives. And they put what they call lactose in it. Lactose. Mm -hmm. 
Anything with an O-S-E is sugar. Fructose, sucrose, all those things are sugar. And there's too much sugar and chemicals and additives in our, in our food today. And that's why a lot of us have health problems in our communities. So when you're talking to, to people, a lot of them say, I didn't grow up with the elders. I don't know nothing about roots, herbs, or medicine. That's what they wanted us to be like. When we went to residential school, they wanted us to forget our language, our culture, our way of life. They want us to be just like them. And I'm a, I've been in a residential school for two years and I ran away. The, the first day I went to residential school, they cut my hair without ceremony. And our people cut hair sometimes when they're grieving or they lost someone they love, but without, with ceremony, they do a ceremony oh, yeah. and then cut our hair. But okay, residential yeah. school, they just cut their hair without ceremony, without even asking anything. And when I spoke my language, they washed my mouth with soap and water. When I sang this song, they strapped my hand with a ruler. They made me stand like this. Then they made me stand in a, in a corner doing penance for hours and hours. And these people that are running in the schools they have a book that says, love thy neighbor. They didn't love us. They have a book that says, thou shalt not steal, but they stole our land. They have a book that says, thou shalt not kill, but they killed our people. They have a book that says, thou shalt not lie. They made treaties with us and promises, but they never kept word for it. So, being, spending time with them and learning about them, I became a, a skeptic. I didn't believe everything I was told. I didn't believe everything I heard. I didn't believe everything I read. And I always ask questions. But here today, I share my story with you a little bit. But we're holistic people. And we're all part of the circle. As holistic people, the elders' teachings are holistic. They teach you about your spirit. They teach you about your mind. They teach you about your heart. They teach you about your body. When I was younger, in our homes, we had no power. We had wood stoves. We had to go out, cut wood, chop it. Sometimes we even use a sweet saw, cutting wood, and then chopping it and hauling it inside. And when we wanted water, we had running water. We had to run to the spring to get the water. <laughs> Today, when you want water, you just turn the tap on. When you want to be warm, you just turn the thermostat up. So we don't do much, we don't do much activity. And as a result, something happens to our body. So we have to be active. We have to be really active. We can walk, we can run, we can dance. Walking, running and dancing keeps your heart strong, keeps your lungs strong. And if you're not walking, running, and dancing, exercise a little bit. Do some stretches. It's good for the body. And try and be, do some exercises. Be active. You don't need to go to the gym. You just do, can do things that, simple things at home, like push-ups. <laughs> Thank you.
So it's it's what you do for yourself that's going to make a difference. Make your heart strong, keep your lungs strong, and your body in shape. So walk, run, and dance. Teach the kids to do those things. And every year, summertime, I have a I have a camp out in the bush. And I teach my nephews and my nieces how to hunt and gather, pick berries, how to trap and how to fish, because it's a life skill. They can be independent. Some tribes, they tell their, their young girls, make sure you find a good hunter so you don't go hungry. I tell my nieces, I'm going to teach you how to hunt so you don't go hungry. <laughs> Some tribes, some, some tribes, they tell their young boys, make sure you find a good cook so you don't go hungry. I teach my nephews how to cook so they don't go hungry. <laughs> All these gender roles and stuff come from uh, maybe the religion, politics, or European ideology. Us, we teach our people survival skills, all the skills they need to know to be independent. <clears throat> but also, a lot of values and beliefs have changed with our people. I remember one time when I was a young boy, my dad and me were sitting outside. Speaking of my dad, my dad never went to residential school. He knew, didn't know how to read and write in English, but he knew how to read and write in Slavic. And he spoke Stony, our language. He spoke Cree. He spoke a little bit of French and broken English. But my mother spent 11 years in residential school. And uh, <clears throat> that the teachings my mom had were mostly from uh, from the residential school, but the teachings my dad had was mostly from our people. So I was sitting outside with them and talking, and all of a sudden uh, my my sisters came home. I have uh, a lot of sisters, and they came with their cousins and their friends, and and they had a big one of these big boom boxes with eight track tapes about this big. <laughs> and they were put it, put it in there, and, and they, they were playing a song and getting all riled up. There was a song called, uh, I think, uh, singer Linda Ronstadt. I am woman, hear me roll, in numbers too big to ignore. <laughs> and my dad spoke to me in my own language. Your sisters are getting riled up. What are they getting riled up about? And, and I said, well, it's a, a movement, a women's liberation movement. It's the uh, women and the girls, they want equal rights. My dad looked at me and looked at my sister. Why would they want to lower themselves to that level? <laughs> <laughs> but in our tribe, we have the uh, women had a special place in the in the community. The women were supposed to be protected, taken care of, look after them, because it is the women that gave birth to our nations, and the women are keepers of the water. Keepers of the water are keepers of life. That's why when a young girl has a little baby in stomach, little baby sitting in water, when water breaks, give birth to life. We all come from water. And it was you women that gave birth to our nations. And if we're looking after the women, we're looking after our nations. So those values, a lot of them, a lot of beliefs and values we've lost. Today, maybe that's why we're not healthy. But in the white man system, 
when you look at the white men's system, when people get married in the white system, what happens is the woman becomes sh chattel, property of the husband. That's why when, when marriages take place, the woman takes the name of the husband to prove that they, they are owned by them. And I shared that story with my nephew. Now a lot of our young people are starting to come, come back and, uh, and uh, do everything in a cultural way. And they said, we're going to get married. We don't want a just of the peace. We don't want a minister. We don't want a JP. We want an elder. Can you do it for us? And I said, yeah. Well, do you have any forms? I said, I can make forms. When, once you get married, you bring it to Alberta registries and and they'll be okay. If they don't accept it, then let me know. I'll, I will take them to court. But they're not, not the only only ones that can uh, certify marriages. Us people, we're also sovereign people. We had our own ways and we can marry them. So we did a marriage ceremony and they, they're married. And uh, my nephew's girlfriend said, do you have to change my name? I said, it's up to you if you want to change your name. Maybe you should get my nephew to change his name to your last name. <laughs> so, but anyway, and I, I did the ceremony and then they went, took, took the papers to Alberta Registries and the government. And they phoned me and I told them, if you guys don't accept it, we're going to court. Because it us two, we have our own ways. And then I talked with them for a few minutes and they said, oh, it's okay, we approved it. <laughs> so, as Native people, you know, we have to bring back our, our values, our ways and everything. A way of healing. Because the doctors, medical industry, health industry aren't helping us. All your programs in your community for many years, we've had all kinds of programs, and they're not, it's not improving. Things are still getting worse. Our young people are getting involved in drugs, fentanyl, alcohol, there's violence, and then now we got people, our young people get involved in gangs, and we have to do something. And then, I don't know, all those programs you have in there were designed by people who don't know nothing about our language, our culture, our way of life. We have to make changes. We have to develop our own programs and our own ways. And I bring, bring these young people camping and I tell them stories. Stories about how, how to be healthy, how to be, to remind them who they are. We're people of the land, Nakoda, which are stubby. That's what we call ourselves. And, and today, I share with you the, the story just to make you think. I'm not saying believe in me or anything, but we're holistic people. We have a spirit, we have mind, we have heart, we have body. And we can decide for ourselves whether we want to be healthy or whether we're going to continue living the way we're living. Today, I, I go hunting for my meat, moose, elk, deer, rabbits, bush chickens. I go fishing. <laughs> I pick wild roots, wild vegetables. I pick berries. I pick a lot of berries. If, <clears throat> And on Facebook, they're making fun of guys say, oh, you're a berry picker. <laughs> I'm a berry picker too, but I still hunt. <laughs> but I pick berries, lots of berries, blueberries, saskatoons, raspberries, strawberries, and I put them in a, in a freezer. Put them in a the freezer and I, all winter, I buy a blender and I make smoothies and I eat them. I put ice cream in there a little bit and a little bit of uh, yogurt sometimes. I cheat a little bit. But I've changed my diet 
I've changed my lifestyle and I've changed my, my way of life. 24 years ago, after I visited my, my uncle, I gave away my TV because my TV, I was just sitting there watching TV, just putting the, pressing the remote, looking for a good, good, good radio station or a good program to watch. And it was, it wasn't helping me. What that wasn't help me be, be active. But I threw away my TV. I haven't had a TV for 24 years. So anytime I want to watch something good, I just go stand in front of the mirror. Hi. <laughs> But one of the reasons I, one of the reasons I, I gave up my TV was I was trying to watch a program. There was a, a show at that time that came on called Tarzan of the Apes, Lord of the Jungles. It's a movie about Africa, and I thought Tarzan was going to be one of those. You know, in Africa, there's a million, million people there, and guess who's Lord of the Jungles? The only white person in South Africa. <laughs> and then they made a movie they called uh, Dances with Wolves. It, in the picture, it looked like an Indian movie, so I watched it. I watched it a little bit, and it wasn't about our people. It was about uh, the lieutenant that was stationed over there. It was mostly about him. So I turned it off and I said, I want to watch something, something real. So I'm going to watch The, the Last Samurai. <laughs> I watched it. There's a million Japanese people in Japan. But guess who's The Last Samurai? <laughs> the only American. <laughs> so I stopped watching TV. Now we got to start as a people. We're, we got to start making our own documentaries, our own videos, our own movies. We gotta start writing our own books. And we gotta share what knowledge we have. Because out there, I think uh, mo most of the knowledge that you learn, I visit universities too, and I argue with university professors. He told me, university professor told me, you know, Many years ago, 20, 30,000 years ago, your people came across the Bering Strait. And I says, no, we've always been here. He says, no, according to history. I said, no, that's not history, that's theory. You guys are not, have nothing but theories. It's according to history and theory, you guys walked across the Bering Strait. To walk across the Bering Strait is about 1,200 miles. You'll need food, you'll need wood, you'll need, if you're bringing your family, then you need to bring your, all your stuff. Plus, walking during the ice age, walking in two feet of snow, you're lucky if you walk 10 miles a day. And if you walk 10 miles a day in one month, you walk 300 miles, you still have to walk another three months to get across the Bering Strait. So that theory is kind of uh, flawed. And I always tell the university professors, you don't have your bearings. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have your bearing straight. And, and they also have another theory, another theory, that man evolved from primates. And I said, maybe you guys, but <laughs> not us, we come from the stars. So anyway, we have our stories, and I think it's about time we start sharing our stories with the young people how to heal ourselves, visit with the elders, 
and and talk about who we are as 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 a people. We're holistic people. And the circle is what they call the medicine wheel, the circle of life, or the sacred hoop. But that's what we follow as Native people. When you're walking around in a bush, when you find a bird's nest, they're around like that. When you find a beehive, they're around like that. Big wind come, big storm come, it won't blow the nest down and the, the beehive down because it's in a circle. The circle is the law of the universe, law of nature, law of creation. So everything has to obey the law of nature. That's why if you look at your culture, it don't matter which tribe you come from, look at your drums, they're round. Look at our communities, everything, our power arbors, our round dances, everything we do is in a circle because that's what, how the universe was created, creation was created. So the birds, they follow the same law. The bees follow the same law. When the four winds come together, they make a whirlwind. They have to follow the law of nature. When you're sitting beside a body of water, when you're sitting beside a body of water, you pick up a pebble, throw that pebble up in the air. Once pebble hits water, guess what happens? It makes round ripples. So we are all part of the circle. We are all part of the creation. We're all connected. We all have spirit, mind, body, heart. At one time, we, we, we got along. We were united. We helped each other. Today, we don't help each other too much. We're competing against one another. And uh, things have to change. But anyway, I speak too much. I'm going to give my my partner. It's 12 o'clock. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for putting up with me. Thank you.